Hello everybody! How are you guys doing today? So today we are going to be discussing Mikolash and Yosefka because this is something that I've wanted to talk about for a long time and I just haven't really made the time to do that. Uh, but I, if, if, if you're a fan of Bloodborne, I think that you'll enjoy where this goes and, and you will like it to a, a degree. Anyway, so uh, first I need to warn you that there are going to be spoilers for um, Cowboy Bebop as well as the Bible. <laughs> so, so if you haven't finished either of those, uh, you might want to skip this one. All right, but beginning. So in order to try to understand Bloodborne, uh, I go through a lot of old anime that I think might actually be really important because we all kind of accept the idea that Berserk is really, really important to uh, Miyazaki's work and other like from software creations. Uh, but I also find that there is that there are many, many other um, television shows and, and, and manga that that I think play a really important role in what Miyazaki is trying to say, or, or at least might give us a better I idea of, of what of what the inspiration is. And I believe that I have found the one big anime that that I think inspires a lot of 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 the function of. Of, of how the world of Bloodborne works. Um, it, it's pretty incredible, just like the similarities. I mean, it, it has like characters that are like almost identical and stuff like that. But, all right, but, 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 but today, we're not gonna be talking about that. Today, we're gonna be talking about Cowboy Bebop, which when I went, so, so I went back and I started watching Cowboy Bebop, went through the whole thing, and I was expecting to find a lot of similarities just because of how important Cowboy Bebop is, 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 is as an anime. But then I discovered that no, not really. Um, there's really only one episode where when I watched it, I was like, okay, that that, that, that seems a lot like Bloodborne. And it's episode 23. Um, other than that, um, so there is this character named Spike where one of his eyes is artificial and it doesn't see the present. It only sees this, this recurring looping image of the past. Look at my eyes, Faye. One of them is a fake, because I lost it in an accident. Since then, I've been seeing the past in one eye, and the present in the other. So I thought I could only see patches of reality, never the whole picture. It's all a... a dream. Yeah. Just a dream. And that makes me think of the bloodshot eyeball from Bloodborne, where it where you use it in order to travel into a reiteration of the past, almost like a memory. Uh, so I, I saw that and I'm like, oh, that's kind of similar. Um, and then there's stuff kind of at, at the end that's kind of similar. And then there's a song in there that's very similar to Murgo's Lullaby. And I'm like, well, maybe that's something. But then again, there, there are a lot of songs that sound like Murgo's Lullaby because it's it's just like a simple music box lullaby. So there are a lot of songs that sound like that. But, but okay, so let's talk about episode 23 because that, that's the really important one, all right? So, synopsis. So there is a bounty hunter named Spike. Uh, he, he, he makes his money by finding criminals and catching them and then collecting the, the income, I guess. I don't know. So, and one of his bounty hunter friends kind of gets into trouble after she seemingly joins a cult called Scratch. And so this organization called Scratch, what they want to do is they want humanity to leave its body behind and to transcend into into a higher plane as data. It's like it's like uh, they they want to like scan brain waves and then just take the brain and just boil it down into I guess just ones and zeros as data. Uh, and then it's like it, it's almost like this this like faux Buddhism where Buddhism kind of believes about sort of leaving your desires behind and kind of transcending to this nirvana. Well, uh, that, that organization, Scratch, seems to have a very similar philosophy going behind it. So there's this scientist named Londis who really comes up with this. And he's a bit, he's, he's kind of a sinister guy. What he does is that he uses this this virtual reality headset, this video game console essentially, uh, in order to shut down people's nervous system and cause them to go paralytic. 
and then from there it's like the person's brain is scanned and then migrated to this other reality where where it is then kind of melded with others people's consciousness and so it's like they all kind of form together into this one place as 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 a collective singular organism which if you've seen any of my other videos that might sound a little bit familiar to you the followers of scratch use the brainwave control device on this new game console to scan their own brainwaves using a program created by their leader londes a program that is said to copy their spirit, which is transformed from brain waves into digital data and relayed onto the universal network where it takes on a transcendent level of being, thus allowing them to exist as souls without bodies. <laughs> and he hasn't returned in two weeks! Madam, you need to talk this out with your husband. I mean, it's his son too, isn't it? Whoa, madam, are you even listening to me? That must be it. It's that new cult thing, you know that? All right, let's take a short break. And there's very similar imagery in that in the place where everyone's souls are kind of being collected, uh, it's like there are a bunch of dead bounty hunters who have, quote, slept to death. So it's like more and more bounty hunters have traveled to this one place. Uh, they encounter this collectivized organism and then they're kind of hypnotized and then they just kind of pass out and then again they i guess they just starve or, or dehydrate and just kind of wither and, and then die and then they're just kind of left there so so that's kind of the trouble that spike is in when he comes across all of this and there's another really important theme in the episode which which we see a lot in a lot of other anime and manga including berserk which is the idea that god did not create a man it's man that created god it's really that God and the devil are really just reflections of the morality and collective life choices of the whole of humanity. Tell me, why do you think people believe in God? Because they want to. It's not easy living in such an ugly, corrupt world. There is no certainty and nothing to hope for. People are lost, so they reach out. Don't you get it? God didn't create humans. No, it's humans who created God. God exists because people want God to exist. And in Berserk, it, it kind of has this like opposite take, where it's like the devil exists because people want something to blame. The devil exists pe because people want to kind of pin pin all, the, all of the blame for all of the world's evils on something. Whereas in Cowboy Bebop with episode 23, it's like people want hope and they want something to kind of cling on to so, so that way so that way they aren't filled with, with just the despair of life, I guess. And then another thing that he talks about is how someone can use television in order to manipulate people's reality. Do you want to know the greatest and also the worst device that humans ever invented? It's television. Television controls people by bombarding them with information until they lose their sense of reality. Now, television itself has become the new religion. <clears throat> television has created a people who believe instantly in dramatic fantasies, who can be controlled by tiny dots of light. And it's important to note that this is the episode that deals with video games. Uh, out of out of all of out of all of Cowboy Bebop, I believe episode twenty three is the only one that deals with video games. So it is a little bit coincidental that all of these similarities take place in the episode that is about video games, uh, and those similarities uh, are consistent with you know Bloodborne, which is a video game. Are you following me? It's a conspiracy, I see. So yeah, so so it's the idea that if I can create a television program or if I can create a video game. I can manipulate your perception of reality. And it's like I can create this whole new world. So what Londis is kind of trying to do is he is trying to create a paradise for people to all migrate to again and form into this collective organism altogether. And even though in, in his like propaganda he says that he wants to leave the body behind, at the end he says Everyone should have the same body as 
I have. So it's like he wants all of humanity to sort of leave their own bodies behind and all collectivize and organize into his body. Oh, and I, I, I forgot to mention, this, this is kind of important. Uh, it turns out that Londis isn't real. He's just this, this artificial creation of a different kid whose name I forget, uh, who is uh, unfortunately trapped in this vegetative state and he's constantly sleeping. He's constantly dreaming because there was an accident. So it's like you have this kid who is constantly sleeping and constantly dreaming and he's able to create all of these things with his dreams. And in by doing that, he's able to sort of take people's consciousness, uh, turn it into data, and then migrate them to this paradise that he has created. And again, he says that everyone should have the same body as he has. And then he also makes the point about the souls that God has given us, our spirits, our spirits which found a way to swim through the immense network and live in the infinity of space. Is not the human body a mere shell, a form of existence all too small and weak for consciousness with such vast reach and potential? Is the, is the human body not just a shell? That's a very interesting one. I like that one. Uh, because I think, I, I think I've talked about this on, on, on this channel before. Uh, so basically, I think there's the idea that in Bloodborne, it's like, this, this is where you are. And it's like your human body is just this kind of pitiful limited shell. Okay, so if you haven't noticed, uh, there are some similarities with Mikolash and with Mensis, I think. It, it seems to me that this, this sounds a lot like what, what might be going on with Mensis and with Mikolash. So it's like, just as with Cowboy Bebop, how there is the boy who is in the bed and he's trying to collectivize all of humanity into this one central place in Londis. It seems like with Bloodborne, it's like you have the mummified uh, Mikolash in the waking world. And then you have the living crazy Mikolash in the nightmare. Uh, and it's like, well, why is he so crazy? And he might be insane because all of humanity is, is collectivizing inside of his own mind. It comes across to me that those Mensis cages that everyone is that, that that everyone's wearing, it's supposed to be like that virtual reality headset that that uh, that the other characters can put on from Cowboy Bebop, and then it's like they're paralyzed and then they're sort of just left there to to die and 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 die, <laughs> and, and and their conscience is supposed to be migrated to this other plane so it seems to me like that might kind of be what's going on with bloodborne uh let me read what the iron cage with what the mensis cage says uh the school of mensis controls the unseen village this hexagonal iron cage suggests their strange ways the cage is a device is a device that restrains the will of the self allowing one to see the profane world for what it is what is a physical body? The body is merely an object. It is a form of existence far too impure to store the gods within us cold souls. Now you will remember. Blood-stained history, material greed, hunger, sexual desire. Desire to dominate, desire for fame, humanity. From the physical body, all the desires are born and the human ego will never disappear as long as desire remains present. Humans will continue to fight to fulfill their body's desires and it will never end. There's no future. You must awaken. Awaken your soul. Rid yourself of that filthy human body now. It also serves as an antenna that facilitates contact with the Great Ones of the Dream. But to an observer, the Iron Cage appears to be precisely what delivered them to their harrowing nightmare. Okay. So there's a lot going on there that I feel like we don't really quite understand. The hexagonal Iron Cage suggests their strange ways. Yeah, I guess it's pretty weird. The cage is a device that restrains the will of the self, allowing one to see the profane world for what it is. Okay. 
So it's a cage. So the symbol, like like the 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 common perception that I've heard is that people think that the cage is is supposed to catch people's consciousness, so that way, it's like when they dream they can go back to their bodies or something like that because because Mikolaj has that line when he dies which is like uh, oh i'm waking up now i'll forget everything or something like that and somehow the cage is supposed to keep that from happening or something like that i don't know um that might be it i don't know symbolically though so they're literally wearing a cage on their heads i think that 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 maybe is supposed to symbolically represent that they're trapped they are prisoners they have a soul and it's kind of trapped in the physical world and they want to release that soul into a higher plane and i don't know if i've talked about the, about this on this channel but it's like you can see with madman's knowledge how it's like the skull is open and then there are all these little slug creatures that are like fuming out of the skull i think that is specifically what people do to try to transcend to another plane it's like so miklash says Ah, oh, cause, or some say cause them, plant eyes on our brains to cleanse us of our beastly idiocy. Right? So he's asking cause to plant eyes on their brains. And if you know my lore theory, when he says plant eyes, I think he's talking about parasite eggs. He wants to plant parasite eggs in their brains, so that way, though, so that way those eggs will then hatch, the slugs will eat the brain, and then if that body is is like incinerated then the slug sort of transcends out of the skull with that person's brain and like all, the, all of those person's memories inside of that inside of that phantasm spirit so that way they can then transcend to a higher plane and i also think that that's probably how the nightmares are literally created so it's like the the, the nightmares are kind of this weird dark fuming amalgamation of of a lot of different people's memories right and it kind of doesn't make sense it's all kind of just jammed together right well i think it might make sense if it's like if it if it literally is just all of these people's memories ascending to a higher plane and so i think the idea is that Mikolash wants to kind of take his old memories of the past perhaps maybe memories of his childhood and things that he's very nostalgic over and he wants to create a paradise out of that where everyone can travel to and the other important thing is that he wants to keep his human body he doesn't want to change his physical form uh so the student set doo -ba -doo -ba -doo, says uniform of the students of bergenworth a bygone institute of learning features a thick cape the healing church has its roots in Bergenworth and naturally borrows heavily from its uniform design. The focus not on knowledge or thought, but on pure pretension would surely bring Master Willem to despair if only he knew. Okay. So what exactly are they talking about when, they, when they're talking about the focus on pure pretension? So the previous sentence uh, is specifically talking about how the uniform is designed and it's talking about the healing church. So the healing church is pretentious. What does that mean? In an interview with Miyazaki, he specifically says that the harder one clings onto his humanity, the more grotesque of a beast he becomes. And he also notes that clerics of the healing church turn into the most grotesque beasts. And we also see that information expressed in the Sword Hunter badge, which states clerics transformed into the most hideous beasts. So if clerics are the ones turning into the biggest monsters, and if the harder one clings on to his humanity, the more grotesque of a beast he becomes, then that means that the Healing Church clerics are trying the hardest to retain their humanity. So it's my understanding that that is what their pretension is. They are not willing to give up what makes them human, like Master Willem is. Uh, and it's like, the students are focusing too much on their physical human forms, and what they need to focus on is that knowledge and that insight. And there's kind of this idea that, that, that maybe they're not willing to leave what makes them human behind. Uh, when I get into some later episodes, uh, I'm going to talk about um, Ghost in the Shell, which, which, which you, know, you know, 
even even by the title, you might recognize some similarities with what with what we're talking about. But again, I think the idea is that Master Willem might be willing to give up what makes him human in order to become something better. But Mikolash and the Healing Church, they might not be. I think they want to keep what makes them human. And so Mikolash is trying to amalgamate all of humanity inside of his body. He's a bit pretentious and he thinks that he's fabulous, right? Uh, and so he wants all of humanity to amalgamate inside of his human body. And he isn't willing to change who he is in order to achieve that end, even though that is the end that he wants. And that's what drives him insane. Because Mikolash is a bit of a kooky guy, right? So I think that's what's going on. Uh, and I derive most of that uh, from, um, from, uh, from uh, Cowboy Bebop and specifically episode 23. Okay. But now let's talk about another funny story. So a uh, long time, months ago, I read this funny little thing on one of the Bloodborne wikis. I don't think it was Meps. I think it was the other one. Where someone said that the song that plays during the boss fight with the one reborn it actually sounds a lot like a song from a from an american at least i think it's american an american movie called the prince of egypt and it sounds a lot like the plagues uh which which is a very good song and so when i read that i was like but then i listened to them and i was like there might be something there there might be something to that okay so that was the one critical critical little clue that led me down a very very deep rabbit hole in that i think that mikolash is supposed to be like moses and the pharaoh and yosefka is actually his second in command and yosefka is supposed to be like joseph who was the pharaoh's vizier slash second in command uh during b or before exodus in the bible okay i'll explain so in the bible uh the jews are so, so this is so this is is this during exodus or is this before exodus one second yes okay so yeah so it is exodus when all this is taking place okay so exodus tells the story of how the jews are enslaved in egypt under under the pharaoh and they have very high quotas and they're treated very harshly moses comes along i'm butchering most of this story it's been a while since i've read it maybe i should refresh myself really quickly well basically the jews despite being slaves despite being slaves they want to be freed uh and moses is is supposed to help them do that even though he doesn't quite want that responsibility so Moses goes to the Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And the Pharaoh says, no. So in response, God strikes Egypt with a bunch of different plagues that are really, really devastating. And each time a new plague hits Egypt, the Pharaoh actually wants to relent and he actually wants to let uh, the Jews go. And he's like, he wants to be like, okay, you guys are free. I give up because this is, this is terrible. I can't fight God. But God hardens the Pharaoh's heart and keeps him from doing that. So it is a part of God's plan that, that Moses is going to beg the Pharaoh to let the Jews go and let them be free. 
but God isn't going to let the Pharaoh do that. It's like God is pulling all of the strings. And Moses and the Pharaoh and 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 the Jews, it's like they're they're all they're all kind of in this weird kind of Lovecraftian way, they're kind of being manipulated by this higher power. Uh, and it's like none of them really have any free will. It's like God is pulling all of the strings. And eventually, after getting hit after, with plague after plague after plague after plague, God allows the Pharaoh to allow the Jews to be free. And then they go off to find the promised land, the land of milk and honey. So, so you have to understand that during this time, Egypt was like, would, would be like the equivalent of like a global empire. And the Pharaoh would be like a global dictator. Like, like, like imagine if all of the modern earth was ruled by a singular empire and there was just a singular emperor who was in charge of all of it. And not only that, but he was also like, 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 like God reincarnate. Uh, Horus specifically? I, th I think he's supposed to be Horus. I don't remember. Okay, but that, that's beside the point. So the point is that the Pharaoh is supposed to be the most powerful man on earth. Uh, he's supposed to be like this global dictator. And the point is to say that the most powerful man on earth is nothing to God. God is far more powerful than even the most powerful man on earth. And, you know, and God is the one who's pulling all of the strings. So, I think that Mikalash is supposed to be like the Pharaoh, and that he's keeping people trapped in this Egypt-like environment. And Yarnum is getting hit with, the, with this devastating plague, right? Uh, eventually, we're going to talk about Oedipus in another episode, and very, very similar things there. Okay, but focus, focus, focus. So, yeah, so I think that Mikalash is supposed to be both the Pharaoh and Moses. He is keeping people trapped in this environment and he's doing things that might be appalling to the gods, but at the same time, he isn't in control. You have to understand that even though he's this puppet master who, who has like all of these like puppet uh, marionettes, is, is that what they're called, something like that? Who, who are defending them and who he, he's, he, seems to be in, he, he seems to be in control of them, but at the same time, He's wearing a cage on his head. He's insane. He isn't the one who's really in control. There is some other higher power that is influencing him and is really pulling the strings. And he isn't, even though he seems to be powerful and he seems to be on top of the world, sort of, he isn't the one who's really in control. He's like the Pharaoh in that regard. And he is keeping people locked and enslaved in this environment, right? Like, like, like. People are constantly being kidnapped and then brought to this underground jail cell and then used for pretty sinister purposes. Uh, sort of like, sort of like, sort of like, um, kind of like, 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 like the Jews in Exodus before they, before they were freed. At the same time, the, again, there's this very Im important theme of like the duality of Mikalash, of the duality in, in Cabo Bebop between What's his name? I forgot his name already. But, but, but between the cult leader, the fabricated cult leader, and and the real life boy. And then there's also this emphasized duality between Moses and the Pharaoh, right? So I think Mikalash, you know, he is alive in this fabricated uh, dream. While at the same time, he is dead in reality. It's almost like there are these two Mikalashes. And I think one is supposed to represent the Pharaoh, while the other is supposed to represent Moses. One is supposed to represent the Pharaoh who is keeping people locked in this environment, while the other represents Moses who is trying to lead people into the Promised Land. Now, you shall not abandon the dream. Right? And he's trying to bring people to the land of milk and honey. But ultimately, he fails. So I guess spoiler alert, if you don't know, Moses, even though even though he's supposed to free the Jews and lead them to the land of milk and honey, he himself does not make it. Uh, he, he makes an error and he he's allowed to see the land of milk and honey, but he does not make it, if, if I recall everything correctly. Miklash has a specific line where he says, we will not abandon the dream. 
So I think the dream is something that he likes and he wants to be there and he doesn't want to give it up, which is interesting. In the Nightmare Frontier, there are these monsters known as Loran Silver Beasts. So we kind of assume that the Nightmare Frontier is supposed to be a dream of Loran or a memory of Loran before it fell to the sand or whatever that's supposed to mean. If Mikalash is the host of the Nightmare, then to me that kind of insinuates that the Nightmare is made up of pieces of Mikalash's memory. His old memories structure the Nightmare, and if the Nightmare is supposed to be Loran, uh, then that means that Mikalash may very well be from Loran. Loran has these, you know, like like those 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 electric spark things that are going on, and the Yahar Ghoul hunters use electric bolt weapons. So there might be some credence to that, you know. And Loran is this dusty, sandy, very Egypt-like place, and Miklash's body is never identified as being his body. We kind of just assume that, given the costume. Uh, instead, it's it, it's it, it's identified simply as a mummified corpse. So he's a mummy. All right, now we're going to get into some Lovecraftian stuff, so spoilers if you haven't read Nier Lethotep or uh, The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath. Nier Lethotep is this many-faced god, uh, or, or like, like, like he has several different forms, or like hundreds, I think. Uh, his most identifiable form is as a mad pharaoh who drives people insane with technology. Much later in his life, he uses cinema and these bizarre static electrical current things in order to hypnotize and enslave a group of people. The hypnotized people are driven into the streets, and when they're exposed to the light of a supernatural green moon, they lose all of their free will, and their, bo and, 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 and their bodies are propelled to walk in certain directions, and they have no say in which way they go or whether or not they'll go at all. They just have to keep marching forward. And then, uh... uh Pilbeam pointed out that the Laron Silver Beast uh, looks similar to the Gugs from the Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, but I don't think that's where the similarities end. So it, in, in the story, there's this explorer who wants to explore the Dreamlands in search of a wonderful mythical place known as Kadath. Along the way, he has to scale this enormous mountain and travel through a complicated cave network. Uh, he's troubled by these half-human, half-canine creatures known as ghouls, and he's confronted by these vertically mouthed creatures known as gugs. All of this is rather similar to what's going on with the Nightmare Frontier. And when the protagonist finally reaches Kadath, he's met by a benevolent version of Nirlathotep who tells him that Kadath is just supposed to be the protagonist's idealized, nostalgia-driven memory of his own childhood in Boston. It seems to me that Mikalash is from Laurent, and he's trying to recreate his childhood in a dream, and in order to do that, he might need to seize and do something bad to Mergo. And that's the big crime, and that's what's causing a play on Yarnum. But nonetheless, Miklash is not entirely in control, and he might just be manipulated by some higher power, as we see in the Bible and your Lethotep. So the Pharaoh's second-in-command, his vizier, was named Joseph. Joseph was the son of Jacob, okay? And th th this is really important, actually. So Joseph was the son of Jacob and Rachel, and Jacob was later named Israel. So the descendants of Jacob are known as the children of Israel and the Israelites. The Israelites are kind of opposed to the children of Cain and the Canaanites. So in, in, uh, in, in Genesis, Cain and Abel are brothers. Abel offers a better sacrifice to God, so God favors Abel, the younger brother, over Cain, the elder brother. That makes Cain very upset and jealous of Abel, so he murders him. God then curses Cain with the mark of Cain, and all of his descendants are cursed as well. So both the Israelites and the Canaanites worship the same God, but only the Israelites are God's chosen people. The Canaanites are, are, are kind of considered outcasts and wanderers. I think the parallel is that Es is Israel, and Cainhurst is Canaan. The people of East worship and serve the gods like they're supposed to, so they're gifted with, with, a, with a favorable blood by the gods. The people of Cainhurst do not. They're superficial and worship humanity and the human body, and they end up doing some horrible things out of jealousy. Uh, Joseph, who is the Pharaoh's second-in-command, is a direct descendant of Israel, so, so he has that special bloodline. So because Joseph who is the son of Jacob slash Israel, 
because he is favored by God, his brothers sort of trick and betray him and sell him into slavery, and he is later picked up by the Pharaoh of Egypt. And, and eventually he is made into like the vizier, who is the second in command. So Joseph has this miraculous ability to have these dreams, so like dreams of stars and dreams of grain, and he uses that to sort of predict the future. Uh, and the Pharaoh is, 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 is very intrigued by that and so makes Joseph his, his vizier and his second in command. So, there's a couple important things there. Joseph, I believe in Hebrew, isn't pronounced Joseph. It's pronounced with a Y sound. It's pronounced Yosef. So I think Yosefka is supposed to be like the feminine, the, the, the feminine form of Yosef. Yosef Yosefka. And it comes across to me that Yosefka and Mikolash are in cahoots together. Mikolash is supposed to be the leader, and Yosefka is kind of a special individual and is the second in command. Because, you know, Mikolash, he's in the nightmare, and we also find Yosefka's blood vial in the nightmare as well. So it kind of comes across that the two are probably in cahoots together, and they're probably doing something. Or some, somehow she has access to the nightmare, to, to, to like, the, the level above right where Mikolash is. And how does she do that? I mean, she, she would either have to be like a spy and an, 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 an enemy to Mikolash, or they are working together. And Yosefka might actually be a member of Mensis. So the student set has, has like a cape and a hood, uh, and that's what Mikolash is wearing. And when we read the Yarhargul set, uh, these kidnappers wear their black hoods low to shadow their eyes. So it looks to me like Yosefka might be hiding her identity and she might be a part of the Mensis cult. And she and Mikolash get along really, really well. So like, uh, Redgrave posited the idea that Yosefka might not be a good girl because there's a lot going on with her clinic that is a little bit suspicious and then you also find her blood vial in the nightmare. That may very well be accurate. We might want to be a little bit more suspicious of Yosefka. But at the same time, I do think her attitude is particularly nice, right? Even if she's deceitful, there might be something to that. So Herbert West can, can explain this a bit more, but he has this, this idea that jealousy plays a really important role in Bloodborne. Um, and also that, that, that there's this certain bloodline that people are jealous of, but if you're a part of that bloodline, then you're a very nice person or something like that. He, he can explain it be better than I can. And he says that that bloodline is is like the Kaner's bloodline. I don't quite think that's the case. I think it has more to do with the, with the Tumerians because it comes across to me that, that the people of Kaner's are supposed to be like the Canaanites and the people of Tumaru are supposed to be like the children of Israel. And throughout the Bible, there's this theme of Cain is jealous of his brother Abel. Uh, and so Cain kills Abel because Abel is favored by God. And then Cain is cursed and all of his descendants are cursed. While Israel, uh, the children of Israel, they are favored by God. And, 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 and just as with uh, Abel, Joseph is sort of outcast by his brothers and betrayed by his brothers because they are jealous of him. So I think, like, if, if you caught that video that I posted, like, way back in December or January, something like that, it would, I think it, it would have had to have been December, um, I posited the idea that, that Yosefka's blood vial might be Murdo's blood, and that it specifically has, has the line where it says that it's produced from, like, a, a highly refined process or something like that. And, and, and then I posited the idea that... Um, that the highly refined process, it's specifically talking about breeding. Generation after generation after generation after generation, there is this selective breeding that's going on in order to create a seemingly pure bloodline. 
and I think Yosefka might be part of that bloodline, and that might be... So Yosefka's blood vial is literally her blood, uh, and, 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 and she might be part of that very special bloodline, and that might be why she's able to conduct such bizarre experiments or something like that. I don't know. And then if... If Yosefka is a member of Mensis, it then also makes sense that the imposter Yosefka kills Yosefka if the imposter Yosefka is a member of the choir, and if the choir are at odds with Mensis. Does that make sense? So you have the imposter Yosefka, you have Yosefka. The imposter kills Yosefka. The imposter Yosefka is a member of the choir. Uh, Yosefka is a member of Mensis, and the choir and Mensis do not get along. So it does make sense that one would kill the other. All right, I thought that I was going to have more time to talk about this. There's still some other stuff that I would talk about. Uh, but uh, I kind of got to get the show on the road, and I have to do some other things. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, that, that was my Mick Lynch video that, that I've sort of been dying to work on. But again, but uh, something came up, and, and I just got to go. All right, so goodbye.